Support this podcast via our Patreon and get more writerly goodness. Visit patreon.com slash nanocast to join up. Welcome to NaNoWriMo Every Month. My name is J. Daniel Sawyer. I'm the author of some 20 books, 34 short stories, and numerous articles and other things, and I am your guide on this journey to use NaNoWriMo to level up to professional output levels. Welcome to The Questions, Episode 45. Today, Tim asks, How does one characterize deeply without slowing down the story too much? This is a tough one, not because it's difficult to do, but because it's difficult to answer. It's a bit like asking a centipede how he walks, what order his legs go up and down in. All right, let's talk about a few things. Let's talk about point of view constraint. If you're writing in a subjective point of view, that means either third person constrained or first person. Your entire narration is characterization for your main character. It's not characterization for everybody else necessarily, but since your main character is always speaking, the words he chooses and the things he says and the opinions he has about the stuff that he's looking at, interacting with, hearing, feeling, touching, smelling, etc., are all characterization, at least for your main character. Now, there's a few levels to characterization. The first is how your character is acting or feeling on a moment-to-moment basis. The second level is the character's social context, the constraints that are on them in how they interact with other people that are imposed from the outside. The third will be your character's internal context, their emotional and personal history the things about them that cause them to act and react the way they do. Now, you don't have to know all this stuff before you start writing. Frequently, you'll discover a lot of it in the process of doing it. Then underneath that, you've got your character's basic drives. These are basically their appetites, their drive for bonding, for sex, for food, for water, for fun, for adventure, for comfort, for danger. All of these are biological hungers that everybody has in some proportion. And then on that same level, you've got their inhibitions, the things that are conditioned into them or that they've taken upon themselves, either through their parenting or through their education or through their religion or through their culture, that stop them from acting on their drives in certain ways. They're frequently the non-rational reasons that someone will not have that piece of chocolate or go surfing at midnight or whatnot. Their fears, their hopes, all that sort of stuff is down here. And then at an even more basic level, you've got the person's basic personality type. Everybody's got one. There's a lot of scientific controversy over how exactly they work and what exactly they are. But everybody's got a sort of neurological substrate that conditions how they react to their different concerns, fears, inhibitions, stimuli, relationships, appetites, etc. All of those things together go into making a person. And a person, just as you do every day, just as everybody does, inflects themselves to a greater or lesser degree when interacting with different people. Someone who inflects themselves to such a great degree that they seem to be a different person with every person they're interacting with is usually someone who's got borderline personality disorder or is a psychopath or is a trained actor or spy. And even with those people, there's usually some through lines, some basic parts of their personality they can't change. Every once in a while you get someone who's a perfect chameleon, but they're very, very rare. Now, to loop back around to how one uses all that stuff to characterize, all of those things color the way that we all see the world, the things that we think are unthinkable, and the things that we think are normative, the things that we don't bat an eye at because we're accustomed to them, and the stuff that strikes us as just downright fucking weird. Everything in the world that you experience is filtered through all those different layers that I just talked about. Everything your characters experience is filtered through all those layers that I talked about in them. 
And so the way to characterize efficiently is to characterize with perspective and action. The hardest part of characterizing efficiently is not taking the easy road. A bland character, a nothing character, someone who doesn't matter, who walks on and walks off and has one line, can be better characterized, and in the hands of certain writers frequently is better characterized, than a main character. Because the constraints of the time that person is on screen, so to speak, are such that you have to get ultra-efficient characterization out of their every move. So, as a writer who's wanting to learn how to do this, what you can do is you can go to some of the writers and screenwriters who do that well and watch their minor characters. Raymond Chandler was a master at this, and so was Dashiell Hammett. Nobody walks on screen in a Chandler or Hammett novel and isn't fully developed to the point where you believe they're real within three paragraphs. They are so damn good that it's still frightening and painful for me to read them. I have got so far to go in my own work. Watching movies from the late 30s through about the mid-60s when the studio system broke up and watching the background characters and notice all the tricks they use to differentiate them and make them utterly memorable every time. The mannerisms, the accent, the ways of speaking, the types of racial or sexist slurs they employ or don't, because that was unusual not to at the time, and that said a lot about the character. The style of dress, the ruddiness of the cheeks, which tells you a bit, at least from that era, about whether someone was an alcoholic or not. Still can. Um, it's just that alcoholism is so much less prevalent than it was then that we've forgotten how to tell by looking across the room at someone if they're an alcoholic unless we've had a lot of personal experience with them. So many little cues. What you want to do is you want to develop your ability to observe and call upon the little cues. The guy at dinner who's always fiddling with paper and turning his napkins into ropes or the one that's doing origami all the time and has this pile of cranes growing up around him as he consumes all the napkins in sight. Someone does that, what does it tell you? It doesn't just tell you they do origami. It tells you that they're obsessive-compulsive in some way or that they're coping with an anxiety disorder or that they're bored. It tells you that they've got a background that likely, likely includes some significant contact with Japanese culture. And the way they arrange the cranes around them can tell you a lot about their deep neurology. If they arrange them nicely in specific groups of prime numbers, it tells you that they might be autistic or that they might have severe compulsive disorder or other things like that. There's all sorts of things you can infer from someone just by looking at them closely and smelling them closely. The smells. You can tell a lot about a person by the way they smell. You can tell what their diet is. You can tell what their hobbies are sometimes. You can smell machine oil and, and grease from under the fingernails if you've got someone who's a hot rodder. Even if they've scrubbed up and are in a business meeting, you might get the faint whiff of orange because orange oil is one of the principal ingredients in the detergents that you find in mechanics shops because it's very good at cutting axle grease. You can tell whether someone smokes. You can usually tell what they smoke. A cigar smoker smells different from a cigarette smoker, smells different from a pipe smoker, smells different from a pot smoker on the West Coast, smells different from a pot smoker on the East Coast because there are different cultivars that are popular. Someone might compulsively chew on a toothpick. Somebody might compulsively chew gum. Those people might be ex-smokers. Or they might be people who have a nervous tick disorder. Or they might be people who are sort of orally fixated and need constant sensual stimulation in their mouth in order to ground themselves. Someone's accent, both the locality and musicality of what they speak with, whether they speak like they are recently immigrated from Russia, or whether they're from Dallas, or from a more genteel part of the Deep South, or from the eastern seaboard where there's just a little touch of it left. 
You can tell whether someone is from New Jersey or San Francisco by the amount of nasal there is in their voice. Southern New Jersey, Middlesex County, has a very nasal accent, but otherwise is indistinguishable from California, whereas Northern California, particularly around the San Francisco Bay Area, is a little more broad and has a little more of a southern edge to it and is a little less nasal than the Middlesex, New Jersey accent. So you can tell where someone's from, even in our current world of flattening accents. You can divine someone's confidence level by looking at them, not necessarily from the way they dress, but from the way they stand, from the way they shake your hands, from the way that they manage their eye lines and eye contact. You can tell whether someone you're looking at has had sex recently and had an orgasm by the way they're walking, and there's different characteristics for a male versus a female post coital walk, but if you're in a window of any time about six hours after the last orgasm, you can tell by the way they walk. There's all sorts of little cues like this that we pick up on all the time. It's the reason that there's those magic moments where you find yourself kissing someone you're attracted to and you didn't even realize that they reciprocated your feelings, and yet somehow you both at the same instant decided it was time to go for it. That's because both of your brains have picked up on all of these subtle cues and worked off each other. There's been a silent dialogue going on that the two of you have not even necessarily been aware of. And that dialogue culminated in that moment where you don't realize how they're suddenly in your arms, but it's happening and everybody's happy about it and it's wonderful. All of these things happen invisibly to us all the time and we don't realize that they happen because our central processing unit doesn't get access to that information very often, but our bank of GPUs in the back do. If you're looking for density and depth in your characterization, put those cues in. The stuff that you're picking up all the time anyway. Find ways to imply. Imply so much more than you state about who your character is and who the person they're interacting with is and what their concerns are at the moment. Give us their attitudes. Give us lots of attitude. Give us lots of voice. But don't just settle for a voicey character, because you get enough really voicey characters from the same author, and the characters aren't well developed, what you wind up doing is you have them all sound the same. And then you get Aaron Sorkin or Joss Whedon, who write fantastic dialogue, but don't go into a lot of depth on their characters very frequently, and who don't connect the way their characters speak to the other levels of their personality. Their characters have their speaking patterns more or less controlled by their culture rather than by their character. And you can do that, but it does make everyone sound kind of samey. And in a book, when you can't see who's talking or hear their voice, you want your characters to be speaking differently enough that you could abandon dialogue tags and you could still see them there. Or at least that's one way to approach characterization through dialogue. You don't necessarily have to do your characterization through dialogue, but if you want to, that's one of the ways to do it. In case it wasn't obvious already, I'm sort of rifling through the dusty corners of my brain trying to think of all the different characterization tricks I've come across over the years. I suppose that's a good survey. Start paying attention to the little details and working those in without comment, even. Just allow the implications to grow. Learn to love implications. Implications are your best friend for going dense. And learn to love free association. A empty bottle on a mantle is just an empty bottle on a mantle. But an empty Budweiser bottle on the mantle that smells like regret, well, that tells you something very important about the person whose eyes you're looking through. It tells you they might have been an alcoholic. It tells you they might have had a one-night stand last night they regret. It could tell you a lot of things, and that implication will drive you forward in your further characterization of that person. So, yeah, go for it. Play around. Look for other people who do it well and study what they do. And, God, if there's one takeaway from all of this, I'll say it again. Learn to love implication. Make your readers feel like the words you're using have a lot more behind them than just the words. You can get a tremendous amount of depth that way. And with that, I'll see you tomorrow. 
NaNoWriMo Every Month is written and presented by J. Daniel Sawyer and produced by Artistic Whispers Productions. Visit our website at NaNoWriMoEveryMonth.com and leave a tip in the tip jar or join the Patreon to support this podcast. NaNoWriMo Every Month is copyright 2016 by J. Daniel Sawyer and Artistic Whispers Productions and is released under a Creative Commons non-commercial attribution no derivatives license. 